morning, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you are in for a treat for the next 60 minutes, and I hope you'll engage using the engage button on your phone if you were with, with this event, because your questions will come right up, and I will promise you your questions will take priority over mine. My name is Jane Oates. I'm the president of Work Ignation, a national nonprofit uh, media entity that's totally devoted to telling the stories like you're going to hear today. Uh, we tell stories about transitions from education to work. And that, those two words really define my three fellow panelists today who I'm going to ask to, I'm going to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves and their organization. Jamie, can I pick on you first? Yeah, of course, Jane. You, you've picked on me for 30 years, so why not now? <laughs> I'm Jamie Marisotis. I'm the CEO of Lumina Foundation. Lumina is a private foundation. We're based in Indianapolis. Uh, we have a national focus uh, to focus on increasing high quality post high school educational attainment. Our goal is that 60% of Americans have a high quality degree, certificate, certification, or other credential by 2025. Uh, since we started this work in 2008, 12 million more Americans have a post-secondary credential than when we started. So we started at 38% um, as a country, we're now at 52%. Uh, we believe that high quality learning is key in the transition to successful work and a good life. I'm Lydia Logan. I'm the Vice President of Global Education and workforce development at IBM with the CSR team. It's a mouthful. Uh, we are focused in, at CSR on providing skilling for free around the world using IBM technology and talent. And we're doing that through a few of our programs you'll hear about later today. We also have made skills first hiring a priority and we're focused on removing the four-year degree requirement for openings at IBM. Kenan Harrison, Vice President of Workforce Partnerships at Reviture. Um, Reviture is the largest employer of entry-level software engineering and emerging technical talent in the United States, um, as ranked by LinkedIn, so take that for what it's worth. Um, we're looking to hire several thousand new nascent software engineers, t tech professionals um, across different IT disciplines. And every single person that we hire into these roles goes through a three-month apprenticeship. Uh, it's a paid apprenticeship, and then uh, what we try to do is launch their career. Um, we've had a great deal of success. We've done this for about 10,000 people in the last eight or nine years. Um, so really excited to be here and, and an absolute honor to be included. Well, it's really exciting. I, I hope you'll agree with me to have all three of you here. And Jamie, since you outed us as being uh, nerds together for three decades or more, uh, I, I just want to start with you, because when people come to something that's talking about learn and earn, they immediately think registered apprenticeships. And we're not going to gloss over those. They're very important. But I'd like you to kind of give an overview of uh, what are learn and earn programs and why. Yeah, let, let's begin with why, uh, the, the why question. Learn and earn is really important because there's a rising demand for talent in the United States. And we need to do a better job of better connecting the learning with the working that people are doing in a world where technology, uh, technology mediated learning and technology mediated work are increasingly driving what we do. And at the same time, our ability to prepare people for human work, the work that only humans can do, is going to be increasingly important. The learn and earn models, I think, are really important at this critical time in society because they allow people to ratchet their way up the, the cycle of the pathways of learning that will allow them to get better jobs, better life opportunities, ultimately allow them to, to be successful. So yeah, certainly uh, registered apprenticeships are one model of learn and earn, but so are internships, so are co-op models, you know, so are practicums, and, and you know, uh, we, we see increasingly that work-study programs and different kinds of work-study efforts are all part of the, the learn and earn model. I think learn and earn is actually important at this moment uh, right now as we are trying to figure out what we're emerging from. Are we emerging from the pandemic or into an endemic or what, whatever this is. Because one of the things that we learned in the pandemic is that that demand for talent is really changing rapidly. It's been accelerated because of the pandemic. Uh, we know that workers of color, particularly women of color, were impacted disproportionately during the pandemic. And we've got to do a better job, <clears throat> a better job of preparing those individuals for this changing world of work. And at the same time, we know candidly that higher education has developed a brand problem. 
the brand problem for higher education is that people's belief that they need to go to college is actually declining. And I think that that brand problem can be addressed in part by learn and earn efforts that allow people to be more focused on the applied nature of the learning, on their ability to understand that there is both a financial reward and a learning reward, a career trajectory reward that ultimately gets them on the pathway of long-term success. So to me, this moment of crisis, the crisis accelerated by, by COVID, uh, the crisis that has emerged for higher education, declining enrollments, uh, increasing questions about, about higher education can be solved in part by these learn and earn models. Well, I think I think you put it beautifully, especially giving me a good segue to Lydia, because I want to, you know, I think the the word talent is at the front of everybody's mind. You know, everybody the the war for talent, uh, the Great Resignation, which I don't quite understand why that that term really went well. But uh, why is IBM? doing what they're doing. And by the way, I want to be open with everyone. Lydia has three programs that I'm going to hit on today, and I may confuse all of you. I love P-TECH. I love, and I want, want you to talk about skills build, and I also love STEM for Girls. And you're probably doing other things, but I, there are three different programs that I just want to outline for the audience that we could be talking about. But I want you to tell me, why is IBM doing this? I mean, they're not going to hire all these people that go to P-TECH high schools. Why are they doing this? So we do it, it's a, it's a social good mission, but it also has to do with making sure there is an ecosystem of talent prepared for jobs that are available now and in the future. So expanding opportunity to jobs in the tech sector for women who have traditionally been kept out, underrepresented minorities and people returning to the workforce after having been out. That's why we're doing this work. We do it in the US and we do it around the world. We do it starting and secondary, and in some cases, you mentioned our STEM for Girls program. We have a, a program that starts exposure for girls, right? We know that girls have been underrepresented, girls and women in tech. So we start early by exposing them to mentors, to experiential learning, where they can do project-based learning, building chatbots or uh, drones, and really understanding that this is a career path they might wanna choose, and what would it look like for them to try it and stick with it. So we have that, we have P-TECH, which is a six-year early college high school model. That's also around the world. There are about 300 P-TECH schools. That has an industry partnership where IBM provides mentors, earn and learn opportunities for the students, as well as a career-based curriculum in school during the program. So we have a, a lot of ways that we reach people. We also have a newer program called Skills Build which is global. We have online learning with badges and other kinds of um, certifications starting at the high school level and going all the way up through post-secondary. Our belief is that people are not taking one path from high school to college to work. We know that, but our training programs have not looked like that and recognized it, and that's what we're doing at IBM. So we have something for people regardless of where they are. They have an on-ramp for training, whether they come work for us or work somewhere else. We have only about 11% of our um, entry-level jobs that are, you know, where we would hire somebody with training and no degree entry-level. But we have a lot of clients and partners who need people who fit that profile. Since we have removed from most jobs that w where we could a four-year degree requirement, we have about 20% of jobs at IBM that no longer have that as a requirement for employment. So it really is something we're leaning into. It is not just, uh, we are walking the talk. Wow, good for you, because I mean, that, that bachelor's degree required, even though many of us have one, is just unnecessary for so many jobs. And it really has left a lot of talent on the table. And kudos to Opportunity at Work, another good entity out there that's putting uh, real attention on stars. I really like that. Okay, Ken, and you heard a lot about IBM. Chomping at the bit over here. I know, I, it's hard for you, right? Yeah. But I bet a lot of people, everybody's heard of Lumina, everybody's heard of IBM. Everybody hasn't heard of Reviture. Tell us a little bit about your model. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have a pretty good brand among our clients, um, and our clients are made up almost exclusively of Fortune 500 organizations or similarly sized organizations um, that aren't companies, right? Large government bodies, et cetera. Um, the point is that 
we have historically worked with organizations that have large tech needs. And the reason that we do that is because we create apprenticeships bespoke to the needs of our industry clients. So what we're doing is, you can kind of think of it as a backwards mapped training program or, or, or workforce development enablement solution. I really, really love the term ecosystem that Lydia used because that is really what it is. We believe that opportunity is highly concentrated, but talent is widely distributed. And how do we bring opportunity to talent as opposed to forcing talent to find opportunity? and eliminating barriers, creating clearly articulated pathways to skills and competencies that make sense is really what we're all about. And so our model is 100% outcomes based and we hire everyone as a W-2 full-time employee for this apprenticeship pathway, but the real key is that they are set up with skills and competencies that make them marketable to our clients, but also long-term, future-proof career folks. We have a 90% four-year retention rate with our clients in tech. 90% of the time, when our folks leave us and go to work for our client full-time, which is generally between 12 and 18 months after they start working with us, they're still there 90% of the time, four years later, in a software engineering job. That is unheard of. Unheard of. Thank you, Lydia. Um, you would know better than I would. And so <laughs> I, I think what we're about going forward, because what we've done is talent enablement. Right now, the problem is no longer that people who are interested in tech are not getting tech jobs, in my opinion. The problem is that there literally aren't enough people who believe that a tech job is on the table for them to fill the roles that exist. Um, so what we want to do is empower more people to believe, fundamentally grow the pie, grow the pie of people who believe that this is even on the radar. Um, so maximizing participation in tech and what you guys are doing at IBM is absolutely a huge part of that. And we wanna create an ecosystem with not just employers, not just tech creators like IBM, like Salesforce, like Pega, UiPath, et cetera, but also from, work, from a workforce partnership standpoint, how do we engage with talent, the sources of talent, where they are right now to provide a pathway into these jobs that make sense for everyone regardless of background. So you've brought up, uh, I think all of you brought up the need for diversity and uh, the populations that have been ignored. Jump ball question, let's make this a conversation. How do we hold ourselves accountable for that? Everybody's out there talking about DEI right now. Uh, everybody's talking about inequity, but let's take it out three years. How will we have looked back to say we did what we talked about doing? How will we hold ourselves accountable? What do you think? Well, I can tell you this. I'm looking at my stats here that were sent to me by our... <laughs> well, cheat, we cheat. measure everything at IBM. <laughs> at IBM, removing the four-year degree requirement resulted in a more diverse applicant and hiring of new-collar talent. So that's what we call high-wage, um, high-skill, non-degree. 63% uh, increase in underrepresented minority applicants, mixed for roles requiring a degree, not requiring a degree, sorry, and a 35% improvement in hiring people who did not have a degree. So we are measuring it. We are looking at what our numbers are every year and trying to do better. Jamie, what's Lumina going to do to hold people accountable? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, so Lumina is an organization, as I said, that's focused on increasing post-secondary attainment, uh, but we describe ourselves as an equity-first organization. So everything that we do has a racial equity lens. And so our efforts are designed to both increase attainment and reduce the gaps in, uh, in racial um, equity. Um, without that, I think it's just a false promise for society and for our collective well-being if we continue to increase attainment but don't narrow those gaps, particularly for African Americans, Latinos, or Hispanics, and Native Americans. So I think it's really, really, really critical that, that we focus on that. To me, there is a, a measurement issue here, right, which is that, you know, what are we doing to actually provide more opportunities for learners of color than what we've had before? And I come back to what I said at the beginning, which is that in this economy, what was revealed to many people who hadn't seen it before is how much workers of color, women of color in particular, have been impacted by these barriers that are in place. And these are historic barriers. These are not new barriers. But, but these are barriers that have been revealed in ways that are really important. 
So finding ways to create gaps, to put equity first in the hiring processes, put equity first in the college admission and completion processes, making sure that we, you know, one of the biggest areas of focus for Lumina Foundation right now is community colleges and making sure that the community college efforts are actually designed not just to bring students in, but make sure students succeed in the community colleges. Many of you know that success rates in community colleges, in too many community colleges, are far too low. So improving success rates for students in community colleges is a critical metric. And one of the things that we're putting our thumb on the scale of, whether it be in our work on employer-aligned credentials around student success, or, or the efforts around increasing participation, getting people in the door from the beginning, it all has to have the thumb on the scale of equity. Absolutely, I think, you know, we talk about eliminating degree requirements and I think the numbers you just shared bear it out. Um, but, but looking at degrees as an indicator and understanding historically what are the issues, the total number of bachelor's degrees in computer science awarded to black and African-American talent in this country in 2020 was 7,747 total across the entire country. There were 2 million undergraduate degrees awarded across the entire country in that time frame. 7,700 bachelors of computer science were awarded to black talent from all universities, not Portable. just HBCUs. There were 750 awarded at HBCUs. So what we're talking about here are huge macro issues, right? Same holds for, for Hispanic American talent, same holds for female talent. Six, almost 60% of all degrees in the United States are awarded to women. 20% are of bachelor's of science and computer science are awarded to women. We've got a problem, right? Um, and it's an empowerment problem, I believe. It is an enablement problem. We have to help people understand that tech careers are possible. And what the, the work that, that, that the, the folks on this panel are doing is absolutely critical. But we have to, in, we have to empower also industry to invest in workforce development and talent enablement. You guys are already ahead of the game. But we have to empower the entire industry to, to prove to them, to prove to industry that if you invest in talent, if you invest in workforce development, you can solve the opportunity gap, but it's not going to happen by itself. Well, I want to talk for a second about, uh, Jamie, I was so interested when Lumina expanded uh, its, its goal to include certifications. Um, I want to talk for a second about if we stop talking as much about a degree and start talking more about alternative pathways to get the skills that you need for jobs, what about quality? You know, how do we really talk quality and how do employers recognize quality? I mean, Jane's credential to do X doesn't mean anything to IBM. How do we make sure employers understand that? But let's talk about quality. Yeah, so for, let me say first, before I get to quality, that you know two things have to be true. Uh, one is that all learning should count, that we should not leave any learning on the table, right? So when we talk about things like non-credit learning, that's got to go away. All learning should count when it comes to preparing people for work and for life. That, that, that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that credentials matter, okay? So I want to be clear that in these skills-based hiring models, they're still measuring what people know and can do. They're trying to figure out what the skills are and trying to figure out how to credential it. It's not a, it's not a bachelor's degree. That's fine. But there's still an effort to measure what people know and can do. And to me, those credentials are really important. It's one of the reasons why this whole theme of pathways of learning is really important. What we've got to do is get people on the ladder of opportunity and pull them through the process so that they continue to gain higher levels of skills both content knowledge and generalizable skills, the things that people, you know, I think erroneously call soft skills, but they're really the durable skills. They're the things that matter long term, critical thinking and problem solving and communicating and their ability to have these these human traits of being ethical and empathetic and compassionate that are increasingly um, important in a human centered work environment. You know, those things are going to be really, really important. So in order to measure that, we need better systems than simply doing what we do so far, which is measuring you know, writing capacity, measuring numeracy and literacy, you know, measuring those kinds of things. We've also got to have better tools to understand you know, how do we measure critical thinking? How do we measure problem solving, communicating, those kinds of things? And in this effort in, in learning outcomes measurement, we are still behind, in my view, in that, in terms of, of being able to do that. We've made some progress. So the quality of the credentials is really important. Third-party validation of those credentials is really important. But we need to make sure that as we bring people through the system, 
they have more learning opportunities and more efforts to add credentials and allow them to advance up that ladder of opportunity. That's really, really critical to long-term long success. For us, I would say probably for all of us on this panel, we went through a traditional learning environment. In other words, probably, I'm guessing now, we graduated from high school, went to college, probably got a four-year degree. Um, that model is no longer the viable model for the vast majority of people in, in this country. It is a continuous model. I don't like the term lifelong learning, by the way. Um, it sounds like a life sentence is what it sounds like uh, for, from, the, from the consumer perspective. But the idea is that we've got to continually upskill our own uh, capacities if we're going to be successful. And that means that getting people into these learning opportunities and continuing to bring them through in this virtuous cycle of learning and earning is going to be really, really important. I think it's also important to recognize we need those equivalencies, right? It isn't an either or. So we have uh, 25 registered apprenticeships in 17 states and 30 cities. Wow. Some of those, m many of those, and we work with the American Council on Education and other organizations on uh, certifications and credits. Our, let's see, which one is it? Software Engineering Apprenticeship carries 45 credits. So we recognize that it is not uh, degrees that we're not interested in degrees or we don't want people going after them it's that they should have options depending on where they are at any given point in their career trajectory opt into for an apprenticeship earn and learn at the same time work for IBM for a while leave go work somewhere else leave go to school take those 45 credits you earned put them towards a degree or something else right you it should be fluid doesn't Back have to, to be this linear. ecosystem idea. And it also shouldn't be either or. I chose the apprenticeship, but it didn't carry any credit. So then when I go back to school, I'm starting back at the beginning. We need to make it additive. And to Jamie's point, all learning should count. And I think to be fair to higher ed, we're seeing sea change, the beginnings of sea change around PLA, around recognition of prior learning. I think there are innovative institutions bachelor's degree, associate's degree awarding, two-year, three, two-year, four-year, master's, et cetera, that are recognizing experience for credit, and they are. Um, but I think it's not systematic. I think it's not the norm, right, still. I think pathways that are linear are, are Jamie, to your point, outdated and obsolete. We have the technology, so to speak. We can do this. This can be compressed. We can we can create pathways. Lydia, similar to what you're saying, we're, we're doing a similar thing, right? We're hiring people who have associate's degrees or 60 credit hours. Um, we're training them as normal, we're putting through an apprenticeship, we're aligning that apprenticeship for a year of bachelor's degree credit, and then we're paying for them to get the remaining 30 credits while they're working for us full time as a software engineer. So now we've created basically a pathway where you can graduate from high school and then less than four years later have an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree in IT or cyber, uh, five to seven industry competency skills certifications, 18 months of work experience, and be on track to making seventy-five, eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year in less than four years from the day you graduate from high school, and for no out-of-pocket cost beyond what you paid for your associate's degree for those sixty credit hours. So, creating, condensing pathways to eliminate time to completion and basically build a co-op into the degree, as opposed to, or basically build a degree into the co-op, as opposed to build a co-op into the degree are the types of things that we need to be doing that everyone should be doing. Every company in America that has talent needs should be doing something like that. And no debt. Well, I was going to no say, debt. Not right. only no debt, no, no out-of-pocket cost. Yeah, that's right. Which is a nuance, right? I mean, right. 80, I think it's 87% of people um, in this country don't pay a dime through Pell and through other financial aid for an associate's degree um, at last count. And so for that group, theoretically, you can get a degree in less than four years with work experience for no money. Yeah, this is key, though. I, I just want to underscore this point that Ken is making, which is that um, the, the fact that that you can go through this, and we, we all know what the biggest concern about higher ed is right now, right, which is debt and increasing levels of debt accumulation. Learn and earn models um, actually reduce the need for borrowing, and in many cases, to Ken's point, they actually result in no borrowing, which is the, the, the ideal model if, if you can get there. But, you know, Jane, if, if higher ed has a brand problem, learn and earn models have a brand identity problem, which is that not enough people know yeah, about absolutely. the, the Reviture um, models of the, of the world. And, 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 you know, well, P 
people know about uh, some of the IBM work, let's, let's be honest, but that's because IBM has made long time investments in this space that has helped to give it some, some visibility. These need to be the norm, not the exception in my view. And so this idea that, you know, so these are not new models, but they are models that need new visibility in the environment that we're in. And we need to do a better job of investing, whether it is in public-private partnership, whether it is in government investment programs. Go back to your topic for a minute ago uh, about registered apprenticeships. On the one hand, registered apprenticeships are a great idea. They're a really good idea. But they are a tiny fraction of what we do in the system, right? 600,000 registered apprenticeships a year, 10.5 million students enrolled in community colleges, right? There's a, it's no, no contest there in right. that sense. Well, one of the reasons is that at the federal level, we've spent less than $2 billion in six years on registered apprenticeship programs. So we've got to do a better job of actually, and again, it's, this is not government's problem to solve, but the point is that we've got to do a better job of elevating these learn and earn models, giving them greater visibility, resources if they need it, but helping the learners understand, the learner workers understand that these opportunities are available to them that allow them to apply what they're doing now and build their skills for the future. Yeah, and I think, you know, all these models, uh, because we've talked a lot about uh, this, that are, are you, is, is higher ed the enemy? Absolutely not. The way we came through higher ed is going to exist until the end of time. The idea is we've just expanded the menu. The other opportunities are just as valuable, just as viable, and maybe better. Now, I want to switch gears because I'm, uh, the audience is really engaged, and you can see the questions popping up here. But one really interesting, we have a lot of educators at this conference. Uh, are tech jobs going to be obsolete as robotics and AI develop further? How's that one? Now, you wrote a book on this. Yeah. Come on. Uh, no, hell no. Uh, you know, uh, pardon my bluntness, but... <laughs> Of course not, uh, but you know it is both. And again, um, um, opportunity at work is a is a good example. It's elevated some of this idea. Tech jobs are not just jobs in the tech sector. Tech jobs exist in most sectors now. Mm -hmm. And so, thinking about tech jobs as not being uh, simply um, existing in in one vertical in our economy, I think is is really important. At the same time, technology mediated work is going to be increasingly important for the vast majority of jobs. And you know, here, you know, what I've tried to describe is this idea that we need human machine complementarity, making sure that what we do complements what the machines can do. We know what the machines are good at. They're good at speed, repetition, algorithmic uh, reduction. But humans have these traits, you know, that ethical decision making, that compassion, that ability to be collaborative, to do the kinds of things we're doing right now, right? Real human interaction. We need to make sure that the, the tech jobs are not just jobs for people that are going to do what machines can do. They've got to use their human abilities to work with the machines and allow them to complement each other in, in, you know, in pursuit of the greater productivity, the higher levels of success that come from that work. And safety. I mean, I'm glad there's machines to do a lot of the jobs where humans use to break their back. You know, I mean, that that's a good thing. But let's talk a little bit more. What's going to happen as as... IBM and your your Fortune 500 uh, clients uh, get rid of some of the lower level tech jobs. What happens then? They're, they're not going to. There's going to be some jobs that are eliminated and sub, some jobs that grow. Give us an idea. Give the audience an idea of what those areas of growth po probably are into the future. I mean, I'll give you one: is cybersecurity, mm. right? That was not a growth area just a few years ago, and now everyone is talking about cybersecurity. It is not just IBM needing cybersecurity, it is almost every business that has data and needs to protect it. And so we have pathways and training around cybersecurity threat analysts, different kinds of uh, data analysts who can go in and look at cybersecurity issues. So that's a whole new set of training that used to be sort of military, yeah. you know. Right. <laughs> uh, it, it, it lived in a very narrow slice of the workforce, and now it's everywhere. Uh, we are far more aware of it now than probably ever before. Uh, so that's a growth area. While other things may be automated or outsourced, there will always be a new burgeoning field, and we need to be ready for that. I think in addition to that, there are training, training that we have on skills build and other training programs at IBM. Again, all free, all available to anyone 
out there, data analyst. So there are skill sets that apply across job roles, whether those are job roles in tech or not. And those are things people should be looking at as right opening access to the tech sector, to jobs, and to other pathways that they may not have considered. They're sort of foundational in a re-entry or an upskilling opportunity for people. What's interesting is about this question is, you know, you can kind of make assumptions one way or the other about what is going to be automated, what isn't. Based on our best guess, right? We're in we're in this in this space. Hun several hundred million enterprise applications will need to be developed worldwide in the next three to five years based on investment, current investment rates of investment in tech. There are about 30 million developers in the world currently. So that alone should tell you that we've there's an incredible talent crunch happening now. It's just going to get worse if we don't empower more people to believe that they can do these jobs. I think low code, no code jobs are coming in huge, huge numbers. Um, I think, Jamie, to your point, virtually every company is a tech company or at least has a tech job or, or several thousand in certain cases. And low code, no code jobs, cybersecurity jobs, I think jobs, traditional coding development jobs, they're not gonna go away. These are the manufacturing jobs of the 21st century. These are hard skills. No one can take these skills away from you once you have them. And they're going to be in demand for basically ever, right? Um, and the other thing too is, and this is our space, we're an entry level IT consulting firm. That's how we operate with our clients. And we're also a workforce development organization, a talent enablement organization. But there is a significant rate of churn and upward mobility in tech jobs where someone who's in the trenches develop, writing code today, three years from now, it may well be in a management position, right? There is gonna be a huge need for entry level jobs as the field grows as well. So I think there's, in addition to all the new stuff, there's also the mature maturation of the market that hasn't happened yet, in my view. So I think the, some, somebody in the, I'm, I'm sorry, Woody, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, we have a, as you would imagine, a huge developer ecosystem with multiple pathways into that, and I think that's another area where People who people think you must have a degree in engineering or a degree in computer science in order to enter that field, and they don't think about the non-degree people who can learn coding or don't Absolutely. need to learn coding to become developers. We have a program called Call for Code, and one of the things that that does is expose people to how you use tech to solve social challenges. Many of those are focused around sustainable development goals. The big idea is, People should understand that anyone can be a developer. Right. And what developers do is to solve problems. Right. And then from there, you figure out what are the skills that you would need in order to enter a develop, develop, developer role. Being a tech professional generally is, the idea of that is intimidating to folks who aren't steeped in that space, right? Um, we're really proud of this fact, so I will say it. We've done this, what we do for almost 9,500 people in the last eight or nine years, 70% of them did not have a tech degree of any kind. 70%. 30% of them didn't even have a STEM degree of any kind, right? We're talking about English majors like me, or political science or history, music majors do really well in our program and in apprenticeships for coding. But I think your point about demystifying tech jobs, specifically developer jobs, it gets lumped in. I work with higher ed every day, every day of the week. and developer, computer science, software engineering gets lumped in with like quantum physics all the time. Right. They're not, it's, it's a totally, these are hard skills. You can do this. If you have the right attitude, you have the right aptitude, and you're given the right opportunity, you can do it. Um, and I think that's fundamentally for us, that's, that's our operating hypothesis. But we have to work, to, I think industry has to work together yeah. as well to provide this ecosystem because there it's are, not gonna, one, one group is not gonna be able to do it. But. There are 500,000 unfilled cyber jobs in the US today. Wow, that's a frightening. 500,000, huge that's opportunity. And, and the estimates I've heard for the next 10 years is 36 million. Right. Well, somebody asked a question from the audience and I think it's a really good one. One of the excuses that we heard, but we've heard from the longstanding uh, learn and earn models like registered apprenticeships in construction, like registered apprenticeships in manufacturing, two sectors that are awfully homogeneous in terms of their workforce is that the people don't, didn't have the skills, those people, 
those women, those people of color, didn't have the skills to benefit from the registered apprenticeship. And that's why they couldn't get in. Um, so there's a cottage industry that's developed, and that's free apprenticeship programs. That, so let's talk for a minute about that. What do you think, uh, is that valuable? What the question very specifically was, you know, do, the, do you work at all with pre-apprenticeship programs? And I know the answers to some of that, but I mean, uh, let, let's talk for a second about these programs that prepare people with the skills they need to benefit from the paid position that is an apprentice. Well, I'm going to leave it to the experts to talk about the examples, but uh, so Lydia brought a lot of data, so I've, I finally got a data point that I want to use <laughs> since she brought so much data, uh, which is that, I mean, to underscore your point, Jane, so of the 30 largest uh, registered apprenticeship programs uh, in the country right now, only four are not in manufacturing or in the skilled trades. And manufacturing and the skilled trades tend to be skewed towards men, white men, and people working in those traditional fields, the unionized context, et cetera. So we have a, a problem with the registered apprenticeship model that I think we've got to work through and figure out ways to get to these other kinds of models so that we can get more of these workers of color, more of women of, of color in particular, into these formalized learn and earn processes so that we can, again, help pull more people through the process allow them to get on that ladder of opportunity and allow them to be to be much more successful. But the reality today of those 600,000 or so registered apprenticeships is that the vast majority of them are not targeted on who has the greatest um, educational um, and, and training skills gaps that we see in the country right now. Um, to add to that, IBM is working closely with the Department of Labor to get some of these new tech apprenticeships recognized in ONET. Um, so there's a gap you know, some of these things are legacy barriers that just require people to say, oh, here's a bottleneck we can fix, let's fix it. We're doing the, we have the people, we have the training, let's just not have the system be the thing that snags people. So we have to be mindful of all of the places where this breaks down along the way for people and think about those personas. The pre-apprenticeship programs are great if they are tied to something that at the end of the day gives them training, readiness for a job. If it is a dead-end pre-apprenticeship program. Now, so some much. of your, your content I've played on Skills Build. Some of your content on Skills Build could fit directly into a pre-apprenticeship program, and it's already connected with the skills that the, the employer is requiring. Right. We have two pre-apprenticeship programs, oh. actually. Um, and I keep coming back to this. What we're trying to do is empower more people to believe that they can do these jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think the one of the ways that you can do that effectively is by providing easily accessible and effective pre-apprenticeship training, pre-training training, if, if you will, to help people understand what are the fundamental logic, reasoning, uh, technical foundational skills that do you need to be successful in a tech apprenticeship? I'm speaking again from a tech lens. I think the model holds for any industry where work experience is necessary to be hired. But for tech, what we've done with a program called RevUp is if somebody applies to come work for us and they're not quite there, or they're not quite ready, we don't say, hey, bye, see you later, don't ever apply here again. We say, go into RevUp, go into this pre apprenticeship program work on your asynchronously for for the for the um, for the requirements because most of these folks have jobs right and they want to come work for us so they get a better job asynchronous for the requirements but we we have committed to providing 2 hours a day every day of the week for study groups for synchronous trainer interaction peer to peer interaction 24/7 through slack and discord for our pre apprentices to get them as quickly as humanly possible to the point where they are hireable right and Reverture Accelerator Program RAP is, is a version of that, but for folks who are in their final semester of either associate, their associate's degree or their bachelor's degree, helping folks understand that, yeah, it's not in spite of your English degree, speaking from experience. I'm an English major as well. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> English minor. <laughs> uh, Teacher. It's not, it's not in spite of your English degree that you can be a good developer or a good tech professional. It's because of your English degree or because of your business degree or because of the skills that you've developed in, uh, in a work-based learning uh, pathway through skills build or whatever. 
it doesn't have to be a traditional pathway. We have to empower more people through pre-training, through pre-apprenticeships to believe that they can do this, right? And that's what we're trying to do. I think that's what, Lydia, you guys are, I've seen some of the stuff you're doing. It's amazing, the, the work that you guys are doing. So one of our uh, audience partners has a, a question about internships. And I'm going to assume they're talking about paid internships, even though many places I work had unpaid interns. But uh, how can employers work more closely with higher education to give that opportunity to more students, I think is the gist of the question. Make it a little easier for higher ed to do it so they do it more. We have a lot of relationships with universities around the world, as you would imagine. Uh, many of those are research relationships, but we also have a, a team of people who focus on what we provide to HBCUs and community colleges. We're, uh, launching partnerships across the country with community colleges and skills build and how can they integrate the two and get closer together. We, in, and so I'm right speaking from the IBM lens, we have clients around the world, all of whom need skilled employees. So we talk to them about, do you, you know, how do we look at where they have openings on the ground, working with a community college, using skills build, bringing in other training providers and making sure that we can help fill their needs. Some of those may be internship opportunities. So I'm right, giving a bigger answer than just internships. But I think we need to be focused and deliberate about bringing the right people around the table, making sure the opportunity is there at the end of the day. Because what we saw for years and years were people getting trained without the job at the end of the path. And maybe they were trained and got a a badge or a credential or a certificate or something, and they took it to an employer and the employer said, I don't know who Tom and Jerry training program is and I, it's great that you just spent 18 months doing this, but this doesn't mean anything to me. So we need to have that connection of making sure the programs are tied to the jobs, tied to the employers, right? And that there is support for learners along the way. And helping the employers understand what do these folks actually know, right? right? And it goes back to the credentialing question right, um, or credentialing versus certification, or however you want to frame it, what we've found mo most success with is building and helping our folks as they go through this apprenticeship have a, a legitimate and, and easily consumable or actionable from the employer's perspective portfolio of skills, not just what are my certifications, not just what are my competencies, what is the actual work product that through this apprenticeship I have created over the last three months, because every single apprentice that we have goes through a capstone project in a simulated work environment with a scrum master, with a project manager, all of these things, and they have work product to show. So it's a legitimate example of exactly what these folks know, and we can prove it mathematically, right? And so we, working towards, it's not that easy, it's capital intensive, it's, it's hard, it's taken us 10 years to get to this scale, blah, 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 but, but helping them understand beyond just credential, you know, verified by a third party is important, but what is the work product? What is, what, are, what is your day one readiness going to be like once you actually get what to the can job? You demonstrate that you can Absolutely. Jamie, could you take a second? You see the question came up. Uh, what's the difference between a certification and a credential? Oh. Take a, do a, do a <laughs> Professor a Marisotis now to give, give you the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the lay of the land here about. So the easiest way to think about the word credentials, and I think it's really important because I think we get caught up in the public dialogue about these terms, and it impedes the conversation. To me, credential is a generic or umbrella term, right? So badges, licenses, certificates, certifications, degrees are all a form of a credential, right? So you go through some sort of formalized learning process, and at the end of it, you get awarded that credential. Now, some people in higher ed bristle when they heard here, degrees are credentials. I'm here to tell you, degrees are credentials. They're one form of credential. <laughs> just like any other credential, because the labor market says that. The labor market says all of these things have value, and therefore we should treat them all as credentials. Certifications, one piece of that, as compared to certificates, by the way, certificates are awarded through educational institutions, right? And they tend to be job or career specific, particularly in, in different industry verticals. Certifications are, are, are awarded by the industry, by industry associations, by by groups that, that are part of the industry. So that, that's what a certification is. But we get caught up in this terminology, right? Badges tend to be third-party mediated efforts. Um, you know, licenses are obviously licensing bodies that, 
where in professions that where, where licenses are, are, are permitted are required. My point is all of these things should count. In, in the ecosystem of credentials, we should be able to understand what you know and can do with that badge, that certificate, that certification, that license, that degree, and you should be able to apply it to what comes next. And I want to come back to the point about prior learning assessment because I think it's really important. In higher education, we have this process, it's a very laborious, labor-intensive process called prior learning assessment in which some institutions try to assess what you know coming in the door uh, to give you some credit in order to be able to, to, to uh, advance in the, in the learning process. The problem is the onus is on the learner, not on the, on the educational institution. And I think that that system is wrong. It is too complex, too difficult. And the best example of this is that too many people exit the military after four or six years. They show up on a college campus and they say, welcome to freshman year. Well, that makes no sense if you understand what kind of knowledge and skills they developed in, in the military. Again, concrete knowledge and skills and those generalizable things, teamwork and, and, and collaboration and, and ethics, all those things that I was mentioning earlier. So it's really important for us to recognize that credentials are important, that all credentials should count, and that we need to have a better lexicon of understanding how all of these different credentials come together. By the way, there's an entity called Credential Engine that is attempting to do this, uh, which is a platform that tries to create some connection for employers, for higher ed institutions, for licensing and, and uh, workforce agencies, et cetera to all try to speak the same language when it, when it comes to, to this work. But it's, it's really important that we get the language right because I think the consumers are the losers in this because they get very, very uh, discouraged in the marketplace when they don't understand this terminology. Yeah. I think the other issue with the terminology is the great thing about LinkedIn is it's a market where everyone can, can sort of market themselves and they don't have to go through a recruiter, they don't have to go through an HR office, they don't have to go through someone else, right? It's a direct to market option, but everyone is using AI optimized algorithms to scan for the employee, the, the potential hires. And if the language doesn't match the job descriptions or the skills and abilities that the role that's open lists, you may be missed for something that really has nothing to do with your readiness for that job. And to the extent that we can start being more unified in how we talk about what people are know and are able to do and are using the same lexicon, I mean, this is right, a big lift, but this is back to one of those systemic challenges that we have. It will make it easier for people who are job seekers to actually get matched with the job that they're ready to do. So now somebody brought up a word that we really haven't discussed, and that word is rural. You know, are the, the opportunities that we're talking about, let's take broadband out of the, that for one second, national disgrace that everybody doesn't have access to broadband, but are these learn and earn opportunities available to people in rural areas? I, uh, Please, go ahead. You have a lot more to say, I'll say this. This is the one upside to us having come through the last two years, we have been forced to figure out how to do things virtually that before we were not even considering thinking about right how to do it. And so now there are a lot more training opportunities that are available to people who are rural who have access to broadband. This is it, right? This is not the purpose of this panel. If anyone wants to hear me on a soapbox, let's talk afterwards <laughs> about, you know, broadband in America or lack of access to it. But I think it is important to understand the opportunities that have come around as a result of the pandemic, making sure that people did have access to work and training and to continue being able to participate or prepare for employment. So there are virtual internships that are paid and virtual opportunities to do apprentice programs. Indeed there are. Um, we're a great example of what you just described. 100%, 100% of the people who we trained through these apprenticeships before COVID were face-to-face -face, um, employees, 100% of them. 100% are now remote. 100% of the thousands of people that we put through apprenticeships every year go through remote. Fully synchronous, fully engaged, very low, very low trainer to trainee ratio, all of those things. I come from an online learning background. So I come from an online higher ed degree completion background. 
guess what? The results are better. Um, when you eliminate the challenge, some of the challenges, especially the, the audiences that we're trying to serve, which are underrepresented groups, typically people that don't have otherwise have a pathway into tech. They don't have $20,000 to throw at a boot camp. They don't have the ability to take on $30,000 on average in debt to get a bachelor's in computer science, whatever. Fully remote apprenticeships are not only possible, they're possible at scale, and they're possible with outcomes of 95 to 97% placement in careers uh, at the end. Because I, I know that for a fact, because we're doing it. Let me just add to that. I agree with all of that. I think that's right. And let's remember that most businesses hire locally. So rural employers should be looking for opportunities for these learn and earn opportunities in the same way that the urban and, and, and suburban and exurban um, employers do in the same way. So, you know, part of the problem, one of the questions that came up, there's a lot of questions that have come through in the, in, in the, in the chat here that we're not going to get to. One of the questions that came up that I really agree with is that too much of the onus is on the learner or the learner worker and not enough on the employers or on the educational institutions. I really agree with that. I, I think, I think it's, a, it's an essential piece of, of, the, of the puzzle here to go back to the, the point about internships. An internship that doesn't pay or at a minimum, absolute minimum, award academic credit should be socially unacceptable in the modern era. You should not be having those kind of, of opportunities anymore. That puts too much of the burden on the learner as opposed to the beneficiaries of these learn and earn models, which is the employers and society and the economy. And so I think it's really important that government and the employers do a better job of coordinating their efforts to elevate these, these programs, creating better opportunities so that it's not, the onus isn't on the learner worker to go find the internship, find the co-op, find the apprenticeship. It should be a, a pull, I keep using this phrase, a pull strategy to, to pull these learner workers through the system because it's our collective well-being, our, our shared outcomes that we get from these learn and earn models that I think is really important for us to focus on. And these kids should, people, not just kids, although most of the world is a kid to me, but the, <laughs> they shouldn't have to decide between learning or doing their homework or putting food on their table. I mean, it should be combined and made easier for them. So I want to go back because there's another question here about uh, traditional higher ed. The traditional higher ed institutions, are they, should they uh, be getting into this certification world, not just degrees? And are, are they doing it now? Are they partnering with, with the two businesses here? And Jamie, who do you think they're partnering with? They are. Yes, <laughs> they definitely are. Um, should, I don't know, I think that's up to them. Do they? Yes. Do we work with some of them? Yes, we do. Um, I think the other thing that's been interesting is higher ed has had a tougher time meeting all of their financial needs with tuition. And so they are thinking of new revenue models. Mm -hmm. One of the new revenue models is non-degree training offered through colleges and universities. That's where some of this comes in. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's really important, and in particular community colleges, right? Community colleges have the flexibility, the ability to be adaptable, to be labor market responsive in real time, all of those things that, that are really important. It's not to say that we should let the four-year institutions off the hook, but the reality of the, of the model of community colleges is that that's what they're, they're sort of purpose built for, for, this, for this moment, in my opinion. It's why we're putting the majority of our resources at Lumina right now in community college efforts and in less than baccalaureate degree uh, uh, strategies because we think it's really important at this moment, again, to create these opportunities, not so that the learning ends at the certificate or the certification, but so that it gets people onto that ladder of opportunity and continues to help bring them through through that system. But yeah, absolutely, you know, higher education has, I, I think, a responsibility to do a better job of recognizing people that come to them with these different kinds of of, of external, externally validated uh, certifications, and then be able to apply it in the learning context that they're doing and collaborate with those certification entities to build better programs for the learners to get them better working opportunities uh, going forward. I mean, I know, you know, years ago when I worked at the US Chamber, it was the community colleges who worked closely with us to make sure people were trained up for available jobs. 
they were willing to work with the employer community. They were willing to design what a new training program looked like and figure out how to attach credits to it, figure out how to make it work for, say, two or three employers. So we would go in, we employers would go in together and say, okay, we will all hire people who complete a program like this at this community college. It is much harder, or at least it was then, to do that at a four-year university that had a lot of other constraints. Um, I, th I do think post-pandemic, people are a little more flexible, but community colleges where the vast majority of students who are in higher ed are starting. Yeah, can I just say one thing about our moderator for a second here? Because she's uniquely qualified in this space of <laughs> higher education and, yes. and, and the labor market uh, because of, of, of her background. And so, you know, quick, quick story about Jane, right? So she was Secretary of Higher Education in New Jersey, Senior Capitol Hill staffer, and then she became Assistant Secretary of, of Labor with the Employment and Training Administration reporting to her. Jane did more to try to bring the education and training worlds together than any leader I've seen in my career. My career goes back to the early 80s. And I think Jane would agree, it didn't go far enough. She, she did right. remarkable work, and yet there is tremendous resistance in the system, this idea that education has to exist over here and training has to exist over there, and that somehow these things are very separate systems and processes. You know, what we know for sure is that education devoid of skills-based knowledge and abilities and training that doesn't give you those generalizable skills that is really important is not going to work in this economy. And so we've got to find a better way of bringing these things together, as Jane has tried to do throughout, throughout her career, in order to do that. And, and you, you really are the, the most qualified person I know who's, who's tried to do this. I think it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And yet we need more Jane Oates out there to provide that kind of leadership. Well, here, here. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, but I want to say, being at Working Nation, I get to see the me's all over the place that are putting this together. And I think the applause that came to me should go out to all of you who are actually making this happen on a local level. And I will put a plug in. Please connect with us at Working Nation so we can tell your story better. Because it's through storytelling. It's through seeing, I mean, you guys all know this. You can't envision being able to move the mountain unless you see somebody else who's moved it. You know, so I think what all of you are doing and the fact that so many people are in this room, this room is packed. And the, it just shows the grit and determination of the real people doing this, this work. And we're so privileged, right, to have them here and to have them sharing their stories with us. Now, I'm gonna go back to one of their questions because, Jamie, it goes back to what you said, and we've been friends for so long. But the, the reality is, how do we move businesses to do what you said, to take the, all the risk off of the poor job seeker or the student? How do we move businesses to do this? I'm giving you guys a second to think because the pressure's on you. <laughs> yeah, and, and we're, we're out of time, so I'll go, I'll go fast in terms of, of, of my um, uh, approach. <clears throat> the, the first is, I think we need to create more incentives for, for, for business to do that. In other words, I think we need to reward the businesses that create the, these opportunities, whether it is through public policy or whether it is through our efforts to try to reward them through, you know, the ways in which, you know, we acknowledge the work of these employers, you know, uh, brand reputation matters, you know, Lydia was talking about the CSR function, elevating that I think is really important. The second thing that I think we need to do to, to get businesses to engage more in this is for them to understand that at the end of the day, the bottom line improves for them as companies. So we've done quickly research at Lumina Foundation on the investment of employers in education and training programs not what are the outcomes for the employees, but what's the outcome for the companies. And what we learned through these very detailed studies that we've done is that employers literally improve their bottom line because productivity goes up, employee recruitment costs go down, and at the end of the day, they literally make more money by investing in employee education and training. Yep. So to me, creating greater visibility for that and encouraging more employers to invest in this is hugely important. Um, my short answer is, specifically around apprenticeships and skills build, we work with our client partners on learning how to do it the way we do it. Some are interested, some may do it, but the start is how did IBM do it and we can show them how we did it and then they can figure out whether they can do it and we hope a bunch of them will. Absolutely, I think to Jamie's point, we are proof positive, that's what we do. We provide 
uh, a way for our clients, these 80-ish companies, large companies, organizations, to do exactly that. We provide an, an ecosystem, a burgeoning ecosystem, um, that allows or, or maybe encourages or, or, or maybe even a, a harder word, industry to invest in talent. And the outcomes are exactly what Jamie said. We see it. We have a 90% retention rate with our clients. By the way, we're less expensive than doing it, than doing it internally because we've managed to create this model. IBM, I'm sure, is the same way. You've got, we see the return on investment almost immediately in terms of it when you invest in talent. Well, we are out of time. I can't thank you enough for joining us. Thank you, South by Southwest EDU. Did I exaggerate? It's the best panel ever. Thanks for being a big part of it. Thank you all.